you doing, guys? This is Michael Rooker, and you're watching Critty Cuddles. Señores, empezamos bien informal porque como ya vieron aquí tenemos en Puerto Rico un aplauso formal a Michael Rooker. Por favor. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to ask the one that I really wanted to ask you. Uh, you uh, with Henry, do you think you had a similar reaction with Merle, that it's sort of a character whose humanity is complicated and complex, and then you suddenly have a, an outpouring of support? Uh, basically, Henry put you on the screen and gave you a career. So I want, want to know if you see the parallel reaction between those two characters. Well, they're both. Uh, Henry was, uh, Henry is really nothing like Merle. Uh, yeah. Henry is very introverted, very quiet, very uh, uh, fearful mm -hmm. individual. Um, um, uh, Merle was it's completely yeah. <laughs> not introverted, not fearful, uh -huh. not um, politically correct, not a gentleman in, in his own right. Yeah, he's, he, he could be a gentleman. He just uh, he phrases his, his words wrong. You know, he calls women sugar tits and, and, and you know, stuff like that. And, you know, and I, cause I, I, there's a there's a scene with me and uh, Lori, and I and I ask her, you know, why we never hooked up. She said, well, <laughs> and I go, and my my character, uh, uh, my character, uh, Merle says, oh yeah, Merle has a way with words, doesn't he? <laughs> He, something, something like that. Yeah, he probably thought funny. they were flirting. Or something. Yeah, you guys listen. You guys probably know the words more than me. I, I once I say them, I, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone. And, and I, like uh, many times when I work, if we have to redo a scene for some sort of technical reason, um, I'm at a loss. I have to. I have to almost relearn the whole thing. Okay. Because I learn it and and then it's it's ready to go it. and I do it and that's it. It's, and I give it everything I got, and I don't have to ever have to come back. That's my thinking. So if I give it all, I give it my all the first time, I don't have to do two or three or four times. I just do it one time. One time is enough. You got it. Boom. If you want to do it, the best way to work with me sometimes is just put, put up four or five cameras. You get the medium, you get the close-up, you get the master, you get the long shot, you get different angles. And boom, you do it one time and, and you move on. That's what we did on the rooftop. Okay. That monologue on yeah. the rooftop was with four, five, six cameras all at once. The other thing that really uh, surprised me is something that you said is uh, with all the, the publicity about the change of show runners is that you, the writers were open to your suggestions about how Merle was going to go out and, uh, and things were going to play out. Uh, is that, you've done a lot of TV, you've done a lot of uh, 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 movies. Is that, is that a usual experience for the third team of writers on a show that's the number one show to sort of take your input in and sort of, because, because you own the character well, so they, much? They, they, yeah, that is very true. I mean, after three seasons, you better know what you're doing, and, and a lot of times you better you, you better know that, you know, I, I don't think I would do that. What makes Merle do it that way? You know, why would I do it that way? You know, that kind of thing. So you gotta, you gotta bring up those questions. And, and the writers like it too, because they get caught up in all kinds of other stuff. So they're doing their gig, they're doing their job, and, and so they're not always, remembering sometimes what has already been established, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, you got to follow a through line, you know. It doesn't mean you can't change, you know, as a character. The character can't grow and change. Merle changed a lot, uh, but but in a way, not really. <laughs> he He's always been, he had always been that way. It's just that, you know, in the given the right situation, you know, he would have reacted and responded in a different way. Even the first scene, like you see Merle on the rooftop shooting zombies' heads off, right? T Dog comes up and he says, Stop doing that. And he's like, Come on. Are you serious? You know? <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to no. hand, gonna hand it over quickly to your fans who are here to talk to you. But. I've seen that that you've been doing the rounds in terms of going to conventions and doing this sort of activity. What what has been the distinctive experience with your fans that you've been able, in Puerto Rico that you've been able to, to share in, in the last couple of, uh, of days? Something that well, we, sets we, us apart, a really. A well, we later. always have a, a the language issue <laughs> is there, you know. So if I talk too fast or, or you guys talk too fast, I don't know what you're saying. You don't know what I'm saying, but <laughs> but you know I understand this. <laughs> <laughs> that is universal, sir. And I never thought I'd see the day to see you do that, so... I know, you know, I know. I hope somebody has it. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But it happens all the time. People come up and they're like this and they're running in place and they're like, yeah, they're waiting for the lady to say, okay, go ahead. Go ahead now. And, and they're like at a, at a starting point and they just come. I had one girl hug me so hard that she almost knocked me over into the other, uh, into the other lines. Tell me about the, your final day with Norman and that final scene. Oh, when when when, when Norman came, when Norman kills takes him. the initiative and stabs me like eight times in the face, <laughs> and nobody gets to yell spoiler. What is that all about? I mean, eight times. You know what? I, the boy never learns. I taught him it only takes one time. <laughs> any time, anything over than any any more than one bullet, any more than one stab in the head. It's overkill, you're wasting energy, energy that could be used to survive later on. So remember when he, when he went on the, on the bridge and he saved the family and all this and all that, and Merle's back there going like, are you kidding me? I mean, look, you know what? Fine, you could save the family and kill 15 zombies if you want to and waste your energy, waste your precious sweat, your body fluids, you're gonna die in the woods, dude. You know, if you can do it with one bullet, okay, fine, go do it. If you want to waste a bullet, you know, to save somebody that's not gonna would probably never save you. But yeah, that was that was Merle's attitude, and you know, the 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 the, the deciding thing was the baby cry. You know, remember the the, the baby was crying, and it was like that was the deciding factor for him. And and also, you know, I'm not going to let him go up there by himself. So, you know, every single actor in that show is like just unbelievably stellar, just the crazy good. And, you know, everybody's loving it. Obviously, you know, you guys are big fans and they're major fans all around the world. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about you as an actor. Um, up to the 90s, uh, whenever an actor got in a movie or a TV series that was fantasy or zombie or superhero, uh, it was considered that it was bad for the career. It has been a, been a shift in the last 20 years in that it actually turned the other way around, that actors are actually looking for to be in this kind of genre. And from your perspective as an actor, uh, what do you think about that? What do you, uh, that you, uh, how you felt about that uh, being the case now in which most actors are looking to be in this oh, kind good of... Good question. I know, I know this question. Um, I've been asked it before, and, and it's a really good one, and I like responding to it because I, I got to tell you, when I went to Telluride and I saw Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer for the first time with an audience, second time with an audience, first time with an international audience, and we lost over 50% of our audience. Wow. They literally got up, walked out the door, did not want to watch it, did not want to even be in the same room with what was going on as, you know, on the screen. And me, the director, the producers are all in the back row watching all this, and we're back there going like, yes, 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 they get it. You know, it's hard to watch. It's not nice. You know, it's not it's, uh, beautiful. The woman being raped, She's not liking it, yeah? And she's not going to fall in love with you after. All right? So that's what was going on in Hollywood. You know, women were being treated, you know, it's just brutal, you know, it's terrible, brutal stuff. And yet all of a sudden now they're with this character, you know, and, and, and just stuff like that. And there are no cop chases, you know, there's nothing like that. It's just really stark, kind of dirty, gritty jungle warfare filmmaking. We were shooting on the streets and the cop would roll around and we'd cut. <laughs> Wait till they go by and then we'd go continue the scene where we left off. And that's how we did the movie, you know, and it cost $120,000. It's my first movie, first character I ever had a through line through and, 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 I, and I did it and, uh, and I'm very proud of it and, and, and it became a, a major, major underground success. People were recognizing me from Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, when I've, I'd already done Mississippi Burning, and, and I'd already done like uh, Eight Men Out, and, 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 and some bigger movies, and they weren't recognizing me from those movies yet. 
But Henry, they were recognizing me from Henry because it was such an such a underground success that it was uh, it just blew up. It blew up. It was crazy. And to really answer your question, as I was leaving the theater, I heard behind me. Someone they didn't recognize me. I heard behind me someone say, "That guy'll never work again." <laughs> <laughs> Boom! And see what happens. You know what? You're right, and it was bad, but it, it, it changed. And I don't know what changed. I think the, the viewing audience changed, the, the recognition that uh, uh, quality work was being done in the horror genre, as, and, and you could flip over. You know what? The actors have been doing it. Actors do this all the time. We could do theater. We can do TV, we can do film, we can do live performance, we can do stand-up. Well, I'd rather sit down when I do my stand-up, though. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> My question is, I know last year you made the Mythbusters zombie special. I did, yes. Um, how was the experience, how fun it was to try to prove that what happened in the show actually can save you from a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Look, those guys will do anything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, gotta go under the assumption that, yeah, zombies do exist. Zombies don't exist, it's just pretend, okay? <laughs> so, but if you go, if you go with the Mythbusters and, 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 you know, zombies do exist, what, was, what, what would be better, you know? A, a, a board hitting them over the head or a single shot pistol? Single shot pistol. You better go with the board because you can swing a whole lot faster than you can shoot a single shot pistol. And single shot pistols only have five, six rounds. You know, so you got five or six chances to make a headshot. And trust me, when 30 zombies are coming after you, <laughs> you ain't going to be making those headshots. When your Captain Meryl from The Walking Dead was left for dead on season one, did you ever thought that he was, going, he was coming back? Did you ever thought that? Was you that? Be reintroduced? I, I thought it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it was going to happen. You weren't um, given a heads up. Uh, I was, I was, I was hired for maybe three episodes, and uh, my my character was supposed to end at that moment, uh, but that the monologue was not there. It was just uh, the monologue was something that happened after I'd done the scenes, and uh, the head producer. Um, well, you know, they were all watching the scenes. They loved all the work. And Frank Darabont came up to me and he goes, I got I to go to L.A. I went, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. See ya. And he left. And then uh, about a week later, about a, uh, four, three, four days later, I was getting ready to go home, packing my bags and stuff like that. And people kept saying, man, oh, man, you're coming back. You're coming back. And I said, dude, I know I'm coming back. It's like a hand cut off <laughs> in a pool of blood. Yeah, that's the only thing I knew. I didn't know that he had written me this most amazing, best four and a half minute monologue that I'd ever done in my life, you know, but he had. And other people had read it already and they knew, but I didn't know yet. They hadn't released the script yet. So I'm thinking, this is it, I'm going home. And that's what I was, in, uh, that's what I was there for, just a little, little part. And um, so, no, I did not know, only until that last moment when they said, no, no, dude, you, you can't go. You really are coming back. And I go, what, what, where, what do you mean? Oh, you haven't read it yet. Oh, <laughs> the actors are the last to no. know. <laughs> Every time, don't ever forget that. If you're an actor in this audience, Realize that you are always going to be the last to know. <laughs> in, the, in the real world, do people treat you like you are really the bad guy? And the second question is about Guardians of the Galaxy. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? To uh, address your first question, uh, there are uh, people in our society that are not well. <laughs> None of them are here. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> and sometimes, yes, they do. Uh, Confused. Yeah, you, you can be in, involved with an individual that is sort of like uh, a, a little bit off. 
people usually approach me with a lot of respect. Because I don't like people running up behind me. I don't like people, you know, doing that stuff, you know. So, and I don't think, I, I don't think there are a lot of people that have seen my work that want to run up and surprise me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm absolutely very loving. I love to hug and, I, and I'm a very uh, caring individual and I, I, I don't like violence and I don't like violence being projected onto me. So <laughs> I, um, uh, you know, you do come across people like that, but y usually you can say, hey, dude, chill out. No, no, look, it's, pre it's pretend, okay? But yeah, it happens, it happens. Uh, I can't say it never happens, but it's happened to a lot of actors. Uh, can you talk a little bit uh, about your character and what's your role in the movie? No. <laughs> See, we're, you're, you're not even on the second trailer, I don't think. And Marvel is always very secretive about really cool stuff, so that um, means that you probably got the coolest character in the movie. So, come on, give, throw us a bone. I didn't say that. No, I'm, that. I'm, I am saying it. I can, I can I tell you it. that my character is a very cool character. Yandu is a, a really, really, really a cool character. And I, and I dug... Uh, all the work that I did with uh, with everybody on set, and um, you, you're gonna have to wait and see. It's gonna be very, you, very interesting and very exciting. And um, I'm gonna fish a little bit. Do you share any uh, scenes with our local boy Benicio del Toro? Did you work with him in this movie? I don't. Who's that? Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> not, not gonna get anything out of him. Time in the makeup chair. I, I hear is it like about eight hours. It, uh, no, it didn't take that long. Uh, okay. Slither took seven hours. Wow. About the same director. And for some yeah. reason, he likes putting me in makeup. I have no idea. <laughs> I think that's some some weird thing, some fantasy of his. But, <laughs> but my my makeup took about oh about three and a half. Oh, there you go. Four ish, and then wardrobe took another hour and a half or so. I had to have a, a, a dresser. Somebody to come in, literally every time, I, somebody would come in and I would offer my foot and they'd put my boot on. <laughs> I felt like I was royalty, you know. And this is, we did do it in England, you know, where, I, I, but I, 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 the guy's helping me get dressed. I was expecting two lovely twins, but. <laughs> Contract you know, I get, I get my money with uh, some little red-headed guy with freckles. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I get a short, very fast story. I, he, he wrote this role for me, Yandu. He wrote Yandu for me. Yandu was never in the, uh, in, in the works, but he was like, oh, I want to put Rooker in here somehow. And so he wrote this role, and he told me about it. I didn't know anything about the role. And, uh, and he said, oh, no, it's a great role, it's a great role. And, and I said, and then I realized that, oh, dude, they just, they, they brought me back. And so it was obviously, it was obvious that I couldn't do the role, you know, because the dates were exactly the conflict. same dates. Con total conflict. Okay. And, I, and, then he, and, he, and then he said, well, you know what, how about this, how about this role? It's a smaller, so he offered me a smaller role. So I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I bet I, I, bet I could get away and we could do the smaller role. And so when, uh, and so that was, that was it. So um, I got killed off. I was told I was going to die. And, uh, and you know, you, you come out of the, the doctor's office and you're like, wow, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm dying. Merle is dead. He's going to go. What do I do now? And I and a little light goes off in my head. A little marble movie. Bing, 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 and I go. <laughs> I pull out my phone and I go. Yo, Mr. Gunn, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> uh, listen, dude, I, I can. You know, I've been thinking about it. I can't do that little roll. <laughs> I'm a big superstar now, man. <laughs> dude, I'm, I am on the biggest TV show in the world, dude. Come on. And anyway, I know you don't, really, you don't have any money for me, and you're probably going to kill me really fast and something like that, and maybe make it really gory and everything. I just can't do that little role, and you know, I can't. 
I can't do that stuff anymore, man. I gotta move on. I gotta do big, big starring roles now, you know? I'm a big cool actor on Walking Dead. Right? And he goes <laughs> and he goes, dude, I totally understand, not a problem. Listen, don't worry, please. And I can see it, hear it in his voice. He's all sad and stuff, right? And and I go, but I got I tell you what I'll do. I will do the bigger role. <laughs> And he said, what? It is, I just got killed off. I'm dying. I won't be in season four. But I could see him, you know, like uh, earlier. I, uh -huh. I could hear him doing it. Uh, my question is actually about Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. You've mentioned in past interviews that while filming it, in between takes, you would sit in a room, a very dark room, and just wait until you were called on set. Uh, my question is... How did it feel to be that deep in character for Henry, especially since he's such a dark and violent character? Um, I, I, I just found it really difficult to go in and out of character. And I was new at this film business and film acting and stuff and whatever. I don't know, film acting, TV, it doesn't matter to me. But I was, I was not used to all this activity around me all changing gels and, and moving and cameras and doing all this stuff. So, and I, I'd just be very curious. I'm a very curious guy. So I wanted, I'd want to know why. And, you know, I found myself leaving where I, I, I found myself not being where I needed to be when they said action. So I, I, I thought, well, I can't, you know, I have to do this different. So I asked the director to get me some place where I can just go and, and hang out by myself and stuff and, and just wait because this stuff is just driving me nuts. And uh, so he got this little room and, uh, and, I, and I said, oh yeah, this is great. So I go in the room and, there, and when I got to the room, every single wall had a mirror on it. <laughs> so I get in this room and I'm like, oh, dude, you gotta get me, get me some newspaper. So I got newspaper and I, I taped up all the mirrors and then I took out the light bulb, and I gave him the light bulb, and then I just sat in the dark. I wanted to just sit in the dark and, and chill out and just stay in character. And so that's what I did. And I, I stayed in character all day. So from, from first minute I came on set, I, I, was, I just stayed in character. And, and, uh, and I wore the wardrobe. I, I wore the road, wardrobe home. So I had, it was my clothes. They were my clothes. So I, <laughs> I kept my wardrobe. So I just got dressed and went to set, and, um, and I stayed in character all day, and, and th I learned an awful lot about that, because, you know, when you, when you, I'm not suggesting everybody should do it that way, because it's not, uh, it's, I don't know if it's a good idea, <laughs> you know, because it, it really messes you up a little bit, and um, so I stayed, I stayed in character, and I, and, uh, but I learned how, I learned how to leave work at work, and go home, and just leave it there and go home from that movie. And a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of people find it very difficult because there's a lot of spillover. You know, when you're an artist, when you're an actor, there's a lot of spillover. And, uh, and when you're in theater school, they, they, warn you, they, they, they want this to happen because they want you to understand that, yes, there will be um, times when maybe if you're like a D.B. Sweeney, who had to, had to bat left-handed and catch left-handed, you know, uh, during Eight Men Out, he did everything left-handed. So he found a spillover, I mean, like all of a sudden, he's realizing that he's doing everything left-handed now. Same thing with Henry or any other movie. If, you, if there's a little bit of spillover, you find that you're, you're developing those characteristics that are what your character would do. And that's kind of a good thing. But when you're doing a Henry portrait of a serial killer, it might not be advisable. No. <laughs> so I, I, I learned very early on how to leave my work at work and, and just forget it and go home and enjoy my life. Because, you know, it, it's nice to be yourself and enjoy life, right? My question was that, how did you feel when you knew you were going to be in the castle of the Walking Dead? Uh, oh wow, I was happy because I had a job. <laughs> <laughs>
It's kind of nice when you're an actor and you have actually have a job and people want to pay you to act. Uh, you feel happy. I feel happy. Thank you. First things first, I love Gene Skeleton Man. That's my, uh, my brother and I, that's our favorite movie. You are really a sick person. <laughs> I know, I know. There are people in the world, there are people in the world that think that we actually did that intentionally. That's probably the worst made movie in the world. But thank you very much. <laughs> I have a question. Do you have any rules that you regret passing? Do I regret passing on, or do yeah, I yeah, re or do on. I regret doing? Yeah, I regret doing. <laughs> well, sorry, my English is kind of messed up. Uh, yeah, there are always roles that you regret. You regret ever even do, ever even thinking about doing, and uh, such as. And then there are roles that uh, uh, that you go, wow! If I had known they were going to rewrite it, I would have done it. You know. So yeah, there's there's been a few of those. Could you be like Merle for like 30 seconds? Yes, please. Okay, wait. <laughs> there you go, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Should ask for more, dude. Did you hear that? That's no, 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 I was going to do something. Okay. That's all you wanted, right? No, no, no. Okay. I want to see how Merle reacts. When you just this... saw. <laughs> Everybody in the room saw it. It's an instant change. It don't even have to say a word. <laughs> okay, I just want to see him how he reacts when this happens. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Isn't that crazy? What a great scene. What a great scene. T-Dog drops, drops the key and it, it bounces slow motion. Boing, boing, boing. Oh, God, it was awesome, man. It was awesome. Thank you. That's... I can't do that again. <laughs> I have two part question. I don't know if you could answer them. The first one is of what you've uh, read or done in the Guardians. Do you believe you're coming back as John Do? Next. No, no, dijo nada de esta. Te va a dar la próxima. Yeah, so. That's it. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I could elaborate on uh, cool stuff and and non cool stuff and anything on the guardians but it's it's really hard because it, it you know um, uh, marvel is a great great group of guys and they and they put a lot of energy and effort and money and we do as well the actors into making this and we want people to be uh, enthralled and surprised and and thrilled and and happy that they went and they paid their uh, money to see the see the show so you know i um Yeah, I, I don't. I got very good at talking and not saying anything. Yeah, my question is: deep down, in your opinion, you think Mur was a good guy or a bad guy? No, uh, you know, good guy, bad guy. It, it's too, it's too one-sided. It's too cut and dry. There's no, there's no, there's no good and bad. You know, that that question is is uh, is uh, we we pose that question. Many times uh, during the filming of this TV show, all the, all the time, is it good or bad? What's good or bad? You know, Merle Merle was Merle. You know, <laughs> if he if he liked you, he liked you. If he didn't like you, he would mess you up. You know, and it's it just he doesn't. He didn't hold any punches. He was pretty out there and straightforward when he wasn't high, you know? And uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 his love and connection with his brother, the only living person in the world now, just imagine now, we're in the zombie apocalypse, and your family, I don't know how many members of your family you have, but if they're all dead, you're only, you're only by yourself, or you're with you and your cousin, or you and your sister or brother, that's it. So his whole goal in life, once he realized and found out that his brother was still alive, was to keep his brother alive. So all the decisions that Merle made leading up to his death were for that purpose, a single purpose. And it was, and it was a purpose that was had nothing to do with him, and everything to do with 
Daryl Dixon. Good question. Oh, um, two questions. Um, what was your initial thought when you first read the script and you read the particular scene when, my, when um, Merle was going to get killed off? And the other question would be, if there was one word you could think of to describe Merle's essence, what would it be? Oh. His essence? <laughs> oh, the Merle? <laughs> um, you know what I, I was told verbally that I didn't see the script yet I was already I was told that I was going to be killed off and so my rea my first reaction was wow I don't have to wear a little Merle anymore <laughs> At the, the, a hand with a knife hand I never have to put it on again I was so happy and pleased. Because let me tell you, in the 115 degree weather down in, in Georgia, it, it gets a little sticky and hot and it hurts and it's like, oh man, I just wanna, I wanna hit something and stab something and you know, never mind. <laughs> no, it gets very frustrating. So, and, my, and to answer your second question, what was the second one? Like if you were to describe Merle, you know, the whole character one word. Merle in one word, what would it I, be? I, I, don't, I don't do one word. Dis, uh, or a series of words. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we do that in acting school. They want to, they want to tell you, find the, the, single, the single word, the single thread that describes your character. Hmm. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> there is no single word. There's no single phrase. Because, you know, we did the, the lady, the young girl said, good guy, bad guy. There's no good guy, bad guy. You know? It's, it's like every moment is different. Every, you know, life is different. I, you know, if I look to you and then I look away and I look back, you're, you're different. It's a different moment in time. So, Michael. What was your experience working with Al Pacino during filming of Sea of Love? Oh, it, was a, it was a good one. I, I, was, I was a very tough guy, and so uh, I always remember when I talk about that, I talk, I, I, I talk about the, the fight scene in the, in the bedroom where I'm, I'm ripping his clothes off and, he, and I want him to show me how he did it, you know, stuff like that. Got a little hot. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a big, that was a, a, a awesome scene. Uh, I'll tell you a little quick story. Well, the first time we went through the, the, the first time we went through the scene, and we got up to the point where he hits me over the head, and the gun goes flying, and he goes after the gun. He grabs the gun. I jump on. Uh, oh no! I grab the gun first. He jumps on top of me and starts choking me. Right? I stand up and spin around and hit him into the mirror. He drops the, he, he lets go of the chokehold, and then I, I throw him again. Uh, oh, and this is part of the whole fight scene. Well, the very first time we did it, I go for the gun, he jumps on top of me, and he grabs me, and he's doing this. You feel that? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, he's, he's choking me out. He's not choking me but my blood vessels have been contracted and I'm gonna pass out. And I'm standing up, I'm supposed to stand up and spin him around. By the time I stood up, everything was going black. Black, 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 black. By the time it got to about here, I said. This. <laughs> and I spun him around. And I jumped, and I was about 210 pounds at that time. I jumped, and with him on my back, we both went airborne, and I landed him against the back mirror. He let go of the choke. He fell to the ground. I went over like this, choking like this. He was down there going like, oh! And he, he looked up to me, and he goes, hey, Am I mm, too much? <laughs> and I go, and I and I go to him. I go, hey, did I too much? <laughs> and he and he goes like this. <laughs> we had no 
further issues. It was completely understood where our boundaries were. Yeah, very interesting negotiation. Hi, how are you uh, doing? In JFK, how was your experience working with Oliver Stone and Kevin Costner? Well, think of all the co-stars that were there. Yeah, Jack Lemmon, John Bacon, Candy, all of these guys were the best of the best in Hollywood and anywhere else, for that matter. And so we had so many great actors on that on JFK. If you haven't seen JFK, just watch it. You know, for the uh, for the work, every single actor in there is is doing something. A lot of times, that's completely different than what they do, and and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of work with so many great actors. It was it was a, it was a joy, of course. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hey, man. Last question, Duke. No pressure. <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, I was hoping you could tell us about your experience working on set of Mallrats. <laughs> <laughs> Mallrats was like one of my first and uh, one of my first uh, comedies. Mm -hmm. I don't get an opportunity to do comedies too often, so when I, I get that opportunity, I I I, I weigh it very heavily, and I I, I want to do it so badly. So I try to arrange other things, and, and I, I usually I, I, I want to do it. So I start out wanting to do it. So sometimes it doesn't work out, but uh, Mallrats was one of these that was perfect. And, and uh, Jim Jacks, who was the producer, said, well, you, you, you know, you play this, this girl's dad, and I thought, dude, I, I'm, I'm too young to play her dad. I would date her. Are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> I mean, she's like perfect age for me. I wouldn't, you know, I, I do, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not old enough. And he goes, well, dye your hair, dude. We'll dye your hair. And, and anyway, he talked me into it. So this is one of the times when I was like, no, I'm, you know, I'm not the right age. There are a lot of other actors out there that are the age that would be appropriate for her debt. But he wanted me for some reason, for some reason. Uh, so, so they dyed my hair. And you've seen it. Yeah. Well, I come in that evening after the dye job, and my hair is orange <laughs> and red, silvery. It didn't turn out gray. Let me just put it that way. Not only did my hair not turn out gray, it burnt my skin. I had like little burn marks on my skin. And I was like, I come and I knock on the producer's door, I go, he comes to the door, and I go, what do you think? <laughs> he can know, he knows. And he goes, well, uh, yeah, that could work, that could work. Yeah, that could work. And I, you think so? And I go, yeah, yeah, that, that, I like it, it could work. And it's one of these little hotels where the mirror is right by the door. And I look to the mirror and I go, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> I turn around and walk away. I go upstairs immediately and I, I shave my head completely. And I'm like so upset that they, that they screwed up my hair and did all this. So I'm shaving my head. Nobody knows I'm shaving my head, by the way. I'm just shaving my head. And, uh, <laughs> and I come in the next morning, first day of work, and I'm supposed to be gray and, you know, fatherly-like. And, uh, I don't know, <laughs> what a joke, right? <laughs> but I go, I, I go and I'm walking, and uh, my hair's been shaved, and the, the, one of the ADs goes, oh, 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 oh wow. Come, come, uh, come this way. And he's bringing me over to the director so uh, Kevin Smith can see my, my hair which is not there. <laughs> the only thing that's there on my head are about eight or nine pieces of toilet paper <laughs> with blood stains on them because I, I had shaved my head and I nicked it like crazy and, and I had all these little things and, and Kevin Smith is down there playing his Game Boy like this and he looks up and he goes, yeah, that's great. <laughs> That was it. It was beautiful. 
and the rest was history. It's, it's awesome. And another little thing, the reason we have chocolate-covered pretzels, uh, yeah. chocolate-covered pretzels are my favorite snack. The dark chocolate, Godiva. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good question. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I regret to inform you that the guy that was before me apparently has telepathic powers because he copied my question. <laughs> I will say this. You could make a very great Lex Luthor after seeing you ball in more road. You'd be an awesome Lex Luthor. Because I was bald? You could like the no. shape of my head, right? No. <laughs> Not only because you were bored. The, the intensity that you projected some, in some scenes of Mordred convinced me. Good thank job. You. Well, thank you. Right. Thank you. So. Yay, one more. All one of more, one more. Let's do it. La ñapa, la ñapa. Um, yeah, it's not that like this. We're squeezing one more. La ñapa, la ñapa, la ñapa, la ñapa. Hi Michael, um, I was here yesterday, I was the one who gave you the drawing, I don't know if you remember me. I do. <laughs> Well, I was wondering, because I want to be in that industry you're in right now, and I totally want to be an artist working for Marvel and working for all the people you've worked with. What do you recommend me to do as a person that has gone from nothing to becoming a great actor, a, a great superstar, as everybody could say? Oh, yeah, well, you know what? It, it, uh, different, different avenues for different people. We all find our own way. But as an artist, you know, you just keep drawing, you just keep working. You know, in the, in the States, in the mainland over there, they do things like dr drink and draw. Do you guys have a drink and draw here? No, I don't. Well, you meet at a pub, and you drink, and you draw. Ah, oh. Yeah. So it's called drink and draw, and it's like a club. They meet every, like, every Friday or every Sunday, whatever. They find a place, and they all meet, and they have drink and draws. And people win money at drink and draws. They have a, a, you know, all the artists come and and you you they'll give you an idea and you draw it. You may go through several ideas throughout the evening, so that's what they do all night long and they drink and they draw. So I my my suggestion would, how old are you now? I I'm 19 years old. Yeah yeah. So go drink some more and draw. <laughs> Señoras y señores, vamos a darle las gracias a Michael, por favor. Thank you very much, sir.